Hi, and welcome to Tradition. My name is Jeff Kastman, and this is a series of interviews that I conduct with fellow Catholics about topics that are of interest to people who are interested in the traditions of the Catholic Church, the things that Catholics have traditionally believed, the things that Catholics have traditionally done, how we have worshipped, the liturgy, and more. And on today's episode, I'm happy to have back with me my friend Kennedy Hall. Kennedy, welcome. Good to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know it's your second time on our show, but uh, for those who may not know you or those that have just heard your name or maybe heard things about you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Uh, yes, I'm sure only good things people have heard. I am a Canadian uh, Catholic uh, from Ontario near Lake Huron, southwestern Ontario. I've got six children. Um, I was a school teacher. I was a Catholic high school teacher. I taught French immersion and I taught religion in French uh, to Catholic students. I was uh, I was never fired, but I uh, basically kind of was encouraged to resign for my uh, traditional right wingism, um, meaning my Catholicism. And uh, so I ended up finding a new career and uh, I've been able to cobble together a bit of a living for myself as an author and a podcaster and an audiobook narrator, which is something I do a lot of now. And uh, so I live in Ontario with my kids. I write for, I, I'm completely independent now. I don't work for LifeSite full-time anymore as I did. Uh, I just kind of do freelance for them. And I have a, a sub stack where I write. I have my podcast. I write books and so forth. And, and that's kind of the Coles notes. Great. And you've got a unique perspective because as bad as we Americans think we have it, you all, uh, especially with that, guy that's running things you really have seen an extraordinary level of persecution and harassment and and not not just from your fellow citizens but from the government as well right yeah it's kind of weird because on the sort of macro level in the federal government it's really bad uh but in my personal life i've actually i mean i should back back up uh, yes i did experience that in the school system it's a catholic school system but it's technically government regulated funded by the government so i i you know I, I was read the riot act and told i was a bigot and all this kind of stuff for saying things like you know marriage is this and not that kind of thing um so yes if you are attached to the government in a, an official capacity it's you know it's it's a it's a it's a liberal dystopia in that sense however funny enough in the province of ontario where i live it's huge three times the size of texas with one third the population so there's a lot of you know free space and all that um, we actually have complete freedom for things like homeschooling. Uh, there's no rules around it at all. Don't tell the government that cause they might not know. Um, so, you know, as far as living a Catholic life on the ground, it's actually pretty good. But if you want to be attached to any provincial or federal government things, then it's basically impossible. So it's kind of like two extremes, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, I think you mentioned Texas. And that's uh, that's a great. Uh, I think that gives Americans a lot of perspective. Yeah, so roughly like almost Texas and Alaska put together. Yeah, the size of Ontario, very very large with a with a relatively low population. So interesting perspective. Okay. Yeah. So the reason you and I are together today is because we we have something to chat about, which is on the the minds of a lot of people, especially those people that are going to be watching this this episode, and that is. Uh, the continued persecution of the traditional liturgy of the church, the the liturgy of the church uh, for basically 19 centuries, almost in a precisely the same form uh, for the last four or 500 years. And for some odd reason, the powers that be really, really don't like this liturgy. And when you consider that people who attend this liturgy probably make up uh, let's be generous. One percent of the members of the church. I think that's being generous, right? When you look at the total population worldwide of maybe a billion four or so of Catholics, the estimate in the in the United States is maybe three hundred thousand people attend the traditional mass. So, so I think that's being fair. But anyway, um, it's it's a relatively small number of people that are interested in this mass, and yet everywhere you go, it's being shut down. It's being canceled it's being restricted priests are being canceled over and so forth and so today we're going to talk a little bit about 
what as a Catholic do you do if you've fallen in love with this liturgy, if you've been, if you've moved across the country to attend a mass that you thought was solid and stable and dependable, where there are going to be priests who taught only what the Catholic Church teaches and were not dissenters. And then all of a sudden, maybe your your parish life is shut down, as it has been recently in a number of places. So, Kenny, what are your initial thoughts on this question? I've, I've maybe I've moved my family, uh, I've been going to a parish. Children are involved. Boys are serving. Girls are involved with the Legion of Mary and and other sorts of things. Maybe even in a school, and then it's taken away. What do you? Um, well, I think maybe if we kind of start from a basic principles um if 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 we do all those things you know we move our family and so forth even archbishop lefebvre you know he said uh, near the end of his life when there was this sort of uh debate about is it right to sort of do a little compromise and sign the dotted line and have permission for the tlm is that enough and he basically said as important as the mass is Ultimately, it's all about the faith. It's the faith that's the point. Uh, obviously, the traditional mass, if you're a, a Latin Rite Catholic, we're talking about the traditional Latin mass. Of course, in the East, they also have traditional liturgies, but for the perspective, it's probably going to be a Latin Rite conversation. Uh, yes, the, Latin, the traditional Latin mass most perfectly expresses the faith. That's why you've moved. That's why, um, you know, you could have just stayed in your home diocese and you could have, or, or whatever, your Novus Ordo parish or something, you could have just gone to the Novus Ordo and read the Catechism of Trent at home. But you said to yourself, there is an intrinsic link between this liturgy and the faith. And when one is taken away, there seems, it's like having, you know, a limb cut off. You just can't move the same anymore. Um, so the, 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 the first perspective has to be, we're talking about the actual, the, the necessity of the fullness of the Catholic faith and it's the faith that saves your soul. And the, the traditional Latin Mass, ultimately, well, it's Christ who saves our souls, but you know what I mean. It's the Latin Mass that, that transmits this to us. So uh, if someone's in a position where it's taken away, then really um, they're going to have to assess what options they have. I mean, in some cases, it's, well, I can go to the diocesan traditional Latin Mass. Because, for example, in uh, Kentucky where they took away the mass from um, Father Collins and Father uh, Kapczynski. If people want to read on that situation, they can. Um, that's the they, um, the missionaries of John the Baptist. That's right. Yeah. In the, the Diocese of Covington, uh, Our, Lady of the Lord, Our Lady of Lords in Park Hills. Very sad situation, but a, a perfect example of, of what we're discussing here today. Anyway, go ahead. Kenneth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Perfect example. Um, I think the rationale was essentially they wouldn't concelebrate or something like that. And they said you had to, whatever. That's inside baseball with the politics of the diocese. But nonetheless, uh, there, the, the bishop did say that they'll still have a diocesan mass to serve that community. So they'll still have a traditional mass. Um, so in a place like that, um, you're going to have to ask yourself, okay, um, is that what we need? Is that what we want? Is that enough? And if it is, then that's the decision you make. Um, where in other cases, you might they might just literally you know take it away. I mean, it's there was literally just a diocesan TLM. You drove to every Sunday forty five minutes to go to the two p.m. diocesan TLM or whatever it is. We used to do that before we went to the society, and and then they just take it away. Well, at that case, um, I always use the analogy. You know, people move all the time, or they make great sacrifices to put their kids in charter schools or something. And that's very noble because that's extremely important. I mean, good education is worth its weight in gold. Um, so in this scenario, if a family's already moved and it's been taken away, that is a huge heartbreak. But in other cases where let's just say, you know, they've just been attending and then they get stripped from them and they can't imagine going back, then at that point, they're going to have to think about making that decision to move somewhere else. Uh, I, we don't have to do that. Funny enough, as bad as things are in Canada, and there's virtually no tradition in Canada, I think there's like, I want to say like 10 places where the FSSP says mass in the whole country. There's no institute. And I think the SSPX says it in about 20 or 22 chapels. 
um, because they got a lot of mission chapels. Some are full time, some are a couple Sundays a month or something like that. But we have the society near us, a thriving community. So we actually don't have that problem, weirdly enough, as bad as things are here. But if we did, I mean, my wife and I have talked about this, we would have to move. We would just have to move. I mean, it's not an ideal situation. It's not immediate. It might take months. Those months will be hard. Those months will be suffering. You know, maybe what do you do if it's just a Novus Ordo and things like that? But would we move to get our kids the right education? Yeah. Would we move if there was no work for dad and we had to move overseas like my family came from Italy to do that sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, you have to do those sorts of things. So I think that's really the mindset people have to have as hard as it is. You alluded to something uh, that I think it's important for us to to touch on in your your comments about why people choose to move somewhere to go to liturgy uh, or why they might drive by a dozen other Catholic churches, diocesan Catholic churches offering the Novus Ordo. And we we frequently hear it said, or or we even just say ourselves as kind of a shorthand, you know, the traditional mass. But it really is about more than the mass, right? It's it's about more than the bells and smells. It's about more than a priest who's wearing the old fiddle back chasuble. You know, it's about more than kneeling for communion. It's about more than women who are, you know, wearing a veil and dressing modestly. Uh, the the mass is, is oftentimes referenced it, it appropriately, but also by enemies of tradition, the mass is referenced and ridiculed, right? They will even say that we make an idol out of the mass, which is a very strange kind of saying. But I think it's appropriate to, to just chat very briefly that it, it's about more than just the liturgy, which is a strange thing to say, just the liturgy, since the liturgy is so much. But the liturgy is a means, right? It's not the end. And, and I think that's important to talk about because of of the crisis, right? Of where, where this is headed, where we've been, what's happening in the church and the world. Do you want to talk about that for a few minutes? Sure. Maybe a, a analogy that will be half adequate. You know, we hear about the virtues of faith, hope, and charity from St. Paul. And although they're all theological virtues and they're all necessary, somehow there's also this ultimate virtue of charity. If we don't have that, we have none of the other ones, even though we need them all. Like it's kind of this paradox. So, um, we need to have the traditional mass. The traditional mass most perfectly expresses the faith, but the traditional mass is at the service of the faith, which is the ultimate thing. Um, so I, I always say this, you know, like for people that say, I just want the TLM. Well, it's like, okay, every single modernist bishop and abbot that was at the Second Vatican Council said the TLM every single day. You know, they are de Chardin said the TLM. You know, uh, whatever, you know, insert Annabelle Bunini, you know, the, the architect of the new mass. He said the traditional mass, you know. Um, so is the TLM enough on its own without the faith, without the catechesis, without the formation of the priests? It's not. And it never has been. Um, at the same time, the TLM itself is a bulwark against heresy in the external manifestation thereof. So for example, like in some parallel universe, Father James Martin, for some reason, likes to say low mass, no sermon, TLM on Tuesday afternoons in his church. I don't know. And you know, you're traveling through New York, wherever he lives, and you don't know who he is because maybe you're lucky to not know who he is. You're like from Germany or something, you're just visiting, and you just find a TLM on your find a TLM app or whatever it is to go to mass on Tuesday afternoon in New York and you stumble in, you have no idea who, who it is. And it's, it's father James Martin. Well, the fact that he's doing the mass to the rubrics, which are, you know, adequate and, and, and perfectly uh, tra trans transmitting the faith and he's not preaching. Well, you wouldn't be at the risk of anything scandalous or anything uncatholic happening in that setting. Whereas that same priest, you put him in the Novus Ordo on Sunday with a sermon and, you know, we've got a rainbow sermon, you know, and the mass is ridiculous and there's whatever, there's scandalous and sacrilege and things. So the TLM isn't everything, but at the same time, um, it is a bulwark. So you, you have to have this, it, it, it is a paradox. Uh, the TLM is not enough, but you also have to have it. And if you don't have it, you've got a major problem. Um, 
And I think that's something, you know, right now we're looking at the potentiality, obviously, of many traditional masses being taken away. Um, Eric Sammons was interviewing uh, Dr. K, Dr. Kwasniewski, uh, about obedience and that sort of thing the other day. And they were talking about the mass being taken away in Texas and Austin. And Eric, you know, like myself, working in Catholic journalism, he has a lot of inside tips that you don't really reveal until it's finally time. You know, all these things come in. I get messages all the time. You know, I don't reveal it till it's time. And Eric was saying, he's like, listen, I can't say these things out loud because it's not confirmed yet. But I, you know, I'm, you know, I'd bet on, a lo- I'd bet a lot of money on the fact that I know a, a bunch of other places where pretty soon they're going to have the Austin treatment. And that's just kind of waiting in the winds. They're going to have their, you know, longstanding TLMs taken away. Um, so also at the same time as that, we do see now, um, there is this insistence, for example, for the fraternity to can celebrate, and this is bringing up these debates amongst people, you know, um, are we here just so that we have access to something that we love, or is there a principle behind why we love that thing where we can't accept anything less? And that's, and that's a debate that I think is coming to the forefront amongst traditionalists who in, in some ways have been very blessed with some more on pontificum and all the traditional masses available. But now as the, the veil is being pulled back and the modernist wizard is kind of coming out and saying, I'm still here guys. Um, now people are going to have to make these difficult decisions about what to do. Let's uh, identify a few key terms. Most of you probably have heard it, but let's just make sure we're clear. Kennedy mentioned a few things. So uh, Archbishop Lefebvre was a French Archbishop, former superior of the Holy Ghost brothers in Africa. He started the Society of St. Pius X. In shorthand, we refer to them as the SSPX or the Society. The Fraternity of St. Peter is a priestly order created by John Paul II, essentially to be competition for the SSPX, a fully approved, established, regularized order for traditional priests who wanted to say the old mass. The Institute of Christ the King Sovereign Priests, also a order created by JP2 to uh, to specialize in the traditional Latin mass. And these these orders are dependent upon the approval of the local ordinary in order to uh, to offer the mass, to serve the faithful, and, and so forth. And increasingly, what we're seeing, uh, the folks in Rome have gotten quite a bit more shrewd uh, and more effective with uh, pressuring those organizations uh, to uh, essentially to close. And what they found is that instead of a direct attack on the liturgy itself, because that tends not to look very good, uh, they are now using things like a requirement to celebrate the chrism mass with the bishop, which of course is, is a new liturgy, it's a Novus Ordo liturgy, as a as a way to force priests into kind of a, what I would call a false dichotomy, a uh, be, be in union with your local bishop or not, by virtue of your willingness to offer the new mass and and can celebrate the chrism mass. Um, I think that's ingenious and it was effective with the missionaries of St. John the Baptist. It's it's going to be effective, uh, whether in small steps or big steps, because it places this enormous burden on the priests. Um, what's unfair about it, of course, is that a, a pope of the Catholic Church created these orders specifically so that they could offer the old mass forget his his long-term goals his intentions motives whatever but it, it's 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 absolutely undeniable that he created these two orders the fraternity the institute and other orders that fell under the old ecclesia day specifically to offer this old liturgy and now his successor and his successor's agents are are going to leverage that very special charism against them to to bring them down um so, so that's the situation that we're in from kind of a, my perspective. Kenny, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I want to comment. I'm going to read something. It's I won't say who sent it to me, but it's a, a well-known traditionalist commentator. And we were talking about this concelebration issue. And uh, I'm just going to paraphrase some of the things he said. Um, he said that the traditionalist movement ultimately is based off of, and I think this is pretty much the, agreed upon you know for pretty much every kind of traditionalist thinker we've seen from like michael davies and and hildebrand to now um there's a principled objection to the novus ordo mass so whether or not someone says i'll never attend that thing 
uh, when they do attend that thing, it's like a penance, you know? So, I mean, for example, Eric Salmon's a friend of mine. He, uh, I think he did a podcast a couple weeks ago saying that even the Reverend Novus Ordo done in Latin doesn't cut it because it still has the same problems as Novus Ordo theologically. And he doesn't want that. Nonetheless, when he's traveling, he'll he'll stomach through a Novus Ordo match his own personal opinion. But the point is, even he is in objection to it, whereas you'd have someone like Dr. Kwasniewski or myself who would openly say, and we'll talk about this in the episode, you know, I wouldn't go to the Novus Ordo. I mean, I would, I would attend and not participate for reasons of charity, like a wedding or something, uh, but I wouldn't per- participate in the Mass for the reasons of devotion or Sunday obligation. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. Um, and also... Keeping that in mind, the anti-traditionalists in Rome, um, they're not going to stop with any particular concession. So the missionaries of St. John the Baptist, um, you know, just can celebrate with us and everything will be fine. No, it won't be fine. Uh, and that's what happened to Archbishop Lefebvre. You know, at the, at the time of these uh, suspensions, um, which I defend in my book, uh, you know, SSPX, the defense, we can do the canonical argument for that if we have to. But at the time of the suspensions that were leveled, um, the nuncio for Switzerland comes to Archbishop Lefebvre and he says, hey, you know, I have a Novus Ordo Missal with me. Just come can celebrate. Funny enough, can celebrate. Come say Mass with me and everything's going to be fine. And Archbishop Lefebvre said, uh, no, I've already said Mass today. You know, very witty response. Um, and because he knew that, you know, I, I use the analogy, it's kind of like the COVID era that we've been through. You know, people would say, well, you know, just take one for the team and just, eat. and I'm not, I'm not judging anyone who was in a position where they had to get vaccinated. I, I'm just kind of using this as, a, as an analogy, but basically go along with the regime and just kind of do what you need to do. Even, you know, it's maybe it's not intrinsically evil, just kind of bend your conscience a little bit, bend the knee a little bit, and then you'll be able to get everything else you need. And that's never how it works with tyrants. It just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Each concession gives, as my friend said in this email, I'm, re- I'm paraphrasing, he says, each concession gives more rope for them to be hanged with. So in principle, if the fraternity can celebrates, well, this is an external manifestation that the Novus Ordo was good by the fraternity. So, you know, okay, well, I'm very glad you've can celebrated. I'm very, gl- or the other option was that they would receive communion at the can celebration, even if they didn't themselves can celebrate. So basically, either attend a Novus Ordo Mass and receive at it, or can celebrate. And um, if they do that, then what is the message there? I mean, ultimately, for those who want to destroy tradition, and they do, like, let's stop pretending they don't want to destroy tradition. They clearly do. Well, okay, very good. You've proven that you're building up your ecclesial communion, these words they use. It's like the fraternity somehow isn't in full communion, which I find kind of hilarious because... People say, oh, the SSPX, you're not in full communion. It's like, well, nobody is, so it doesn't mean anything. Um, So, you know, build up your communion. And I'd like you to build up more communion by by once a month, I want your priests to offer on Sundays the Novus Ordo in Latin, because that's the next step, you know. Um, And my friend said to me, I'm convinced that the main thing that Cardinal Roche, who's in charge of liturgy right now in the church, wants, he wants to tell the FSSP, that they're not allowed to do other sacraments besides the Eucharist in the old rite. So this would mean no FSSB seminaries or, or no, no traditional ordinations and so forth. And you know, this it, is kind of, sorry, go on. It, it, Kenny, it, it's so strange just to sit and listen to the, this being talked about because the Catholic Church has many different rites, many different traditional rites, and it's never been a threat to the unity of the church. Can you can you imagine saying to someone who was raised in the Maronite rite, which is the rite probably closest in kind of a linguistic and cultural way to the apostles, right? It's it's the Aramaic that they they spoke and so forth. I don't want to create you know liturgical divisions where we don't need them. But the point is, you've got the Maronites and you've got Byzantine and you've got the Copts and you've got what's the Indian uh, right? You, you've got... Yeah, the Syro malabar the Syro, all those, Syro yeah, malabar. Yeah. Okay, you get on and on and on. We've got all these rights, okay? And it's never been a, a threat to the unity of the church, but the hinge upon which they now are exerting pressure is this sense of, well, the, the traditional Latin right is in some way a threat to the, the unity of the church. It's an absurd argument on its face, right? 
Yeah. Um, we, well, we've already established, though, that e e there's there's really more to it than the liturgy. It's the what do they believe and yeah. how do they live and and um, and, and those th kinds of things that get to the formation aspect of what's happening at these places where the traditional mass is offered versus what's happening at the places where it is not offered or where it's it's persecuted. Uh, it, it's it's if I can again I hate saying it's more than just the deepness of the liturgy, but it's the it's the fruits of the liturgy, right? It's it's what comes from those who are actively participating at the traditional liturgy versus those who are let's let's give them the the benefit of the doubt actively participating at the new liturgy. We we see a very different outcome, broadly speaking, right a across decades and across hundreds of millions of people you know it's not a blip it's not a statistical anomaly the outcomes are substantially different yeah and and i'm gonna touch on that point that's a great point to continue kind of the discussion we discussed beforehand um and so don't let me get away from that because i want to talk about like how could it even be the case that if you go to the Novus Ordo versus going to traditional mass you know, to, to speak in layman term, why is there more uh, building up of holiness? I'm not saying I'm holy. <laughs> a holy person wouldn't say that. Uh, but why is there a building up of holiness in a more obvious way in the traditional liturgies versus the Novus Ordo? It seems to be kind of arid. I'm going to get to that in just a sec. But what you mentioned, though, is it's so is so on point about this absurdity of persecuting the traditional mass. And this is why I'm writing a book right now on modernism for Sophia Press. At the heart of modernism, which is, we say in English, the synthesis of all heresies, but if you read the Latin by Pius X, he actually uses an analogy for like the sewer system of Rome. What he means by synthesis, he means the place that catches all the rough, the, all the garbage and, and excrement. That's what he thinks modernism is. So he's pretty strong on it. Um, so inherent in modernism is the evolution of dogma. Inherent in modernism is this principle of vital imminence that there is this there is this truth of religion that changes with the needs of man based on his experience of religious phenomena. That's essentially what it is. So when someone says, when someone, when someone presents an, an antithetical attitude towards a traditional mass, I'm not accusing every single person that does that of being a modernist because we're not formed, so we don't really know. But just the basic principle that every single latin rite saint until 1970 and there haven't been that many since every single latin rite saint since 1970 was nourished by this liturgy but somehow to do that is against the unity of the church it's necessarily a modernist proposition because it necessarily it, 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 it is impossible to avoid this idea that the way that religion is practiced must change because it must evolve so there's no way of being attached to the Novus Ordo in any capacity without being at the risk of at least being exposed to modernism. Not everyone who goes becomes one, but you are exposed to it. And um, so uh, what was the point that I said I was going to make right after this? Well, that it's more than than just the, the liturgy and that there's, ah. there's something else happening here. Right, because so what you say about the fruits of those who attend the traditional mass and again, this is not self-aggrandizing. It's not about me. I'm talking about other people. Um, Holy Communion is not a, it's not like taking Advil where, you know, you ingest the thing and you have the ache and no matter what you think about it or, or whatever, it's just going to go and take away your ache. The grace of the sacraments is not a panacea. It's not a vaccine. You know, continue the analogy with whatever you want. They are, there is a potential of an actualization of grace that is there for you to be actualized in your soul if you're better predisposed to that thing. So this is why I say to people, they'll say, oh, you know, well, the Novus Ordo is valid. It's like, well, saying the words of, like Thomas Aquinas talks about this. You could go into a bakery as a priest and say the words of consecration and you've got a bunch of Eucharists. I'm <laughs> like, right. it's absurd. It's absurd though, you know? Validity, and, and, and I've, I've gotten flack for this. When I say validity is a very low bar, I don't mean validity is not important. What I mean is it's very easy to achieve validity. That's what low bar means. Well, so, and, and, and a great relevant reminder is that the earliest Anglican liturgies 
right after Henry split from Rome, those those liturgies were valid. Those were validly ordained priests. They were saying a liturgy that had that was the effectively the traditional Latin mass. Those were valid liturgies that Catholics refused to go to. They refused to go to a traditional Latin mass offered by validly ordained priests where there were valid sacraments. There had to be something else going on. There was a reason, right? And it got to the, the schismatic or schismatic nature of, of what was happening, even though the mass was valid. And so I, I, I think where we're going is that that it's not a question is uh, is the Novus Ordo valid? Everyone with good sacramental theology understands that the the essentials are are present there. There's more to it than just that, you know that that bare part, and it gets to these outcomes that we're talking about. And I want to quantify that because it's dangerous when when uh, when you say or when when trads say, "Hey, just look at the people that go." There there's there's a difference. It's, it's always dangerous that you're getting into kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy there. But this has been measured. Uh, Brian, Williams, right. Brian Williams, who's a liturgy guy, uh, ran a survey, or he shared the survey. I, I don't recall if it was his, but he shared the results of a survey of uh, that was conducted of thousands of people, people who attended the traditional Latin Mass, uh, people who attended the, the Novus Ordo. And the, the outcomes that we're talking about, the fruits were dramatically different. You know, there there was, uh, for example, ninety percent of the people who were attending the Novus Ordo approved of contraception, fifty percent approved of abortion. Think about that abortion. Um, you know, whereas with those that attended the traditional Latin Mass, it was a two percent approval of contraception and a one percent approval of abortion. I'm still trying to figure out who those people. <laughs> Who's that person? <laughs> um, yeah, but but there, you know, there were things like. How often do you go to mass? And the and the people who attended the Novus Ordo said that they, on average, the people who attended mass every single week, it was twenty two percent said yes, versus ninety nine percent in the traditional Latin mass. So when we say that there's more to it than just the liturgy, we're talking about the word you used earlier. Perfect was uh, how well you're disposed to receive the graces that are present there, and so so. Let's make the very best possible assumptions about the Novus Ordo liturgy for a moment. Let's assume that the that the Eucharistic sacrifice is valid. Let's assume that despite what we see as defects in that new liturgy, that God is pouring out precisely the same amount of grace to those who are present as he does in another liturgy because of his love for us. Then what it's now talking about is how well are you disposed to receive that? And one of the principles of the sacramental theology is you receive the grace you're disposed to receive, right? Even that even that spiritual communion, if you yes. can't get the Mass for some reason, if you're disposed, I mean, you could receive immense amounts of graces. So imagine you're there at that Nova sort of liturgy. God is, is wants to give you as much grace as you could possibly receive. How well has that new liturgy formed you, created you, disposed you to receive in that moment. That one single question is is part of what we're talking about. And we we know by looking at the liturgies, just left and right, we know they're not the same, which is crazy because I when I grew up and first heard about it, I was told over and over again, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same. But you can look one of the, you know, something cannot be and not be at the same time. We know they're not the same. So even just this simple question of how well does the new liturgy dispose those who are there and and we could start to see now why the outcomes are different uh, and we don't have time to go into all of that but I, I i wanted to drill down a little bit deeper about what you said um i know you might have something else to say but i i, I want to start to to talk about the law and obligations because sure. part of where we're going with this conversation is your mass has been canceled or you don't have access to the traditional latin mass how now do you fulfill your Sunday obligation? And the people on the other side, the establishment, and those who don't like tradition, they're going to say, well, it's very easy. Go to your local parish church where you've got the Novus Ordo. It doesn't matter that you don't like it or approve of it or don't think it's as good. Uh, so where do you want to go with that? Kennedy? Okay, I'm going to recommend a book. It's by Dr. K. It just came out, Bound by Truth. I've read it cover to cover. Uh, I'm in contact with Dr. K very often. I, you know, he's one of my favorite living scholars. Um, and he has a whole section in this book on the Sunday obligation 
and the new liturgy. And it's worth pointing out, Dr. K is very pro-SSPX, but his home parish is a fraternity parish. Um, and he has no problem attending any traditional parish, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so it's, I think he's a good witness to this because he has a background. He has, I mean, he's way more qualified than I am in a scholastic sense. I mean, he's been studying these things for decades. He's a professor, a PhD, all these kinds of things. So his, his, um, his understanding of what it actually means to be obligated for Mass on Sunday isn't just traditionalist conjecture. It's citing you know, the consensus of the theological manuals before the Second Vatican Council and so on and so forth. So the church, the church tells us that we fulfill a commandment by going to Mass on Sunday. And the commandment is the most important thing to keep in mind. It is the Ten Commandments, keep the Lord's Day holy. Okay? So the divine command is to keep the Lord's Day holy. The law of the church is to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Now, because it's a just law, because it's a, 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 a good law, because it's a reasonable law, all Catholics are bound to it under the normal circumstances, and to intentionally, without having an exceptional reason, such as what we'll talk about as a tech, whether it could be illness or spiritual reasons or whatever, to not attend, if we just say, well, I just don't want to go because I'm in a bad mood or whatever, or I'm hungover or something, then that's a mortal sin because we are breaking the commandment of God knowing that we're doing so. That's why it's a mortal sin, essentially. However, that we must attend Mass presupposes a lot of things. It presupposes that when we go to Mass, we can keep the Lord's Day holy. And that's the kicker because, you know, let's use the most egregious, e egregious example. You know, your parish is run by Jimmy Martin doppelgangers. So the mass is bad. The preaching is bad. There's fiducia supplicants blessings going on. You know, it's the most absurd situation you have. Clearly, there's going to be no way that you can keep the Lord's Day holy if you're thinking about strangling the priest while going up to receive Holy Communion from the Eucharistic hand minister in a, in a, in a miniskirt. And I don't say it's a lady because you never know these days. You know, so, you know, there's going to be, I mean, that's, a, that's an obvious example. It's, it's a silly example. It's possible. But the reason I bring it up is because it's kind of like when you talk about morality with someone who doesn't believe there's like real good or bad. You got to bring up the Stalin thing. You got to bring up the Hitler thing. And they'll say to you, okay, fine, fine. You know, Hitler was wrong. It's like, okay, I agree with you. But there's a lot of degrees of badness before we get to Hitler. There's a lot of degrees of, of, of badness in liturgy before we get to a clown mass. So really, what are we talking about? We're saying, in the most extreme scenario, it's just a ridiculous, you know, it's Vanity Fair. Like, it's just a problem. I mean, it's, it's clearly egregious, awful, whatever. I can't go to that. You know, I was having a conversation with a, a well-known Catholic podcaster who's anti-SSPX. We were texting, and he was coming at me saying, the SSPX says you don't have to go to the Novus Ordo to fulfill your Sunday obligation if that's all that's there. And he said, this is a deep confusion. And I said to him, I said, listen, man, if Jimmy Martin's in your town and offering mass and it's the only one to go to, are you bringing your kids? I said, I'm not bringing my kids and I'm not going. And he didn't respond because what are you going to say to that? You know, oh, I would go. It's like, no, you wouldn't. So, so they got to keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to all obligations in the church, the obligations, as I said, have presuppositions. So if you actually look into, and again, I recommend this book by Dr. K because he's got all these citations. Before the council, the understanding of Sunday obligation was actually, and I use this term in a strictly philosophical sense, there was actually a lot more liberality to how it was understood, meaning there was a more generosity in the application. So when you read about these old theological manuals that were used to train priests and so forth, these old catechisms, they would say things like, well, you know, if, a, if an opportunity for a, a vacation comes up and, and you can't go to Mass, it's fine if you do that once or twice a year. Or if uh, you have a, an opportunity and it used, uh, I think it was from like Ireland or England, and it said during a lambing season, so, you know, during the harvest time with the animals. And it said, if you have an opportunity at a, at, a, at a county fair to make a good run of it and make a lot of your income, don't worry, just go to, go to, the, to the fair to, to sell your lamb. You know, uh, it said things like uh, in the first trimester and the last trimester and when you're nursing, it's not necessary to go to mass for women. I'm thinking to myself, 
these traditional ladies would attend mass for like half of their life between the age of 20 and 40. Um, uh, and many, many other things like that. It said like, if you were with a child and out of wedlock, you didn't have to go because you didn't want to be a cause of scandal or be subject to, to, to scandalous opinions. Uh, if they were going to be announcing your marriage bans at a mass, you didn't have to go to mass. If you had to walk more than, I think it was like three miles yeah, or if you had to hour. drive yeah, yeah. one hour. Yeah. Like, so the point being is that even in the, in the old days, there was this understanding that, again, the purpose of fulfilling your Sunday obligation was to keep the Lord's Day holy. So if there was some unforeseen problem or some continual problem that made it impossible for you to do so and be predisposed in the right way, then you could fulfill your obligation to keep the Lord's Day holy in other ways. Now, yeah, it's, and I think it makes sense, um, if you'll collect your thoughts there for a second, I wanted sure. to make a few specific examples that I think people would would understand, you know, sometimes it's important that we step back like we're, we're small children uh, who are studying their, you know, their catechism to prepare for first communion, for example, you know, what is the whole point of this? What is, what is the point of the church? What is the point of the liturgy? What is the point of the commandment? What is the point of, of the canonical obligation? What are they all ordered to? And they're, they're ordered to our good. They're ordered to our benefit here on this earth they're ordered to our spiritual growth they're ordered to our eternal destination to reach heaven that's the point people criticize our laws and our rules and so forth as if they're punitive and it's all about you know like like it's about being mean and not wanting the people to be happy right the the, the anti-catholics are kind of like uh the two-year-old who says you know oh you don't love me because you won't give me the candy that i want <laughs> but yeah but just rules are ordered to the highest good. And, and so the, the rule to, to honor the Sabbath is ordered to our, our good. The, the uh, interpretation of that rule by the Catholic Church through the obligation is that attending Mass is the best way to, to be ordered to that good, to adore God, to be present, and so forth. But as Kennedy did a great job explaining, there there have always been lots of reasons why your good wasn't served by attending Mass, because there was a higher good. Um, nursing mothers, as an example, it was common that nursing mothers did not go to Mass. That that was just, that was common. They didn't need a special dispensation. They didn't have to, you know, write the priest. and get. That was just understood that they were better served being at home to raise those children to form those those souls, and and today we would not hear that quite as often. But but today we would all agree. Hey, when you're sick, you don't go to mass. Not not just for your own welfare, but so that you don't get other people sick. Well, well, if you're in prison, if you're in a hospital, if you have a job that you have to work, either because the job is important to society or because you have to work to survive, we all know that all of these things are reasons why we'd not go to mass. But somehow, a lot of people start to trip up on the question of, well, what if the priest is a heretic? What if he is a notorious heretic? Do you have to go to his mass to satisfy your obligation? Is, is it God's will that you expose yourself to the danger of that heresy just to satisfy an obligation? Think about that. I have to be in communion, active communion, willingly with a heretic. When the church has always told us we we can't do that, we we have to avoid, we have to flee from heresy. Or what if he is a notorious effeminate sodomite, and he yeah. is promoting sodomy at those liturgies? If you wouldn't go for fear of giving someone the flu, or fear <laughs> of getting the flu, yeah. which only can harm your body, yeah. why wouldn't the the heresy or the, the the sodomy be a problem? What if that priest has abused you or someone you know and for some reason is still in his office are you now obliged to go to that mass of course not and canon law talks about moral impossibilities that's right so so i i think it's really important that we understand as catholics the traditional understanding going back hundreds thousands of years of what these rules are are ordered to and we we don't want to make the mistake of a lot of people who are kind of in the middle, establishment people who think it's all about the law. 
And, and it's not all about the law. It's about God and it's about what's good for you. Remember that God has, has died on the cross and the mass is a representation of that death, that sacrifice for your soul right now, but also eternally. That's the point. And if going to the mass is, is a problem, then, then your obligation is dispensed. This is not Jeff talking. This is just straight out of canon law. The new catechism, both are clear about this moral or physical impossibilities. Kennedy? Yeah. And, you know, um, there's a great uh, uh, catechist, I guess would be his claim to fame, Matthew Plessy. He runs catechismclass.com. And he's written, I mean, he does, the, he's like one of those guys who's into baseball statistics. Like, who knows what he knows? Why? No one does except for him. He, he's like that with, uh, with catechisms. And an interesting point about catechisms. If there is if there is a catechism that has been universally received and accepted and and promulgated for like a long period of time, um, then we accept this as being indicative of the church's universal and ordinary magisterium. Meaning, there's no way to go into error with this thing. Okay, which raises an interesting issue with the new catechism because it's been revised many times and there's been problems with things. Um, but the same thing is true with basically any catechetical work that is received by the bishops and approved and used for long periods of time. The idea is that God would not allow in a, for, for something that is harmful to the faith to be peacefully accepted for the census fidelium, for the sense of the faithful for long periods of time. It's sort of a, it's sort of a sign of divine approval. So one of those, those books here, I'm actually going to read a, a tiny passage to explain what you and I have been saying, but so succinctly. This is from, um, it was originally published in 1929. And it was called Moral Theology, and it was written uh, first in French. And um, anyway, at the very outset of this section, it says, excuses from assisting at Mass. Any moderately grave, I think that's interesting, moderately grave, right? Any moderately grave reason suffices to excuse one from assisting at Holy Mass, such as considerable hardship or corporeal, we all understand that, being sick, can't get there, whatever, or spiritual harm either to oneself or to another. Now, this was written, published, you know, 40 years before the Novus Ordo. So even in the time of only having traditional masses, it was already a given by these accepted moral theologians that are promulgated, works promulgated throughout the church, that if there is even a moderately grave risk for spiritual harm to oneself or another, the obligation does not bind. Well, I'll have this conversation with people and they'll say, Kennedy, listen, you're a big boy. You're a traditionalist. You, you know your stuff. There's no way you can tell me that you... Uh, attending the new mass once is going to is going to cause spiritual harm to your to yourself. Well, first of all, that might not it will because I won't be able to have a well I won't be in a good place if I'm forced to go. Uh, that's one. But also, there's a, a very high likelihood you're going to witness a lot of things that are scandalous. There's a very high likelihood you're going to witness things that are sacrilegious, etc. And okay, sometimes interlocutors they'll grant that they'll say, okay, fine, I get it. But you can't say that Kennedy there's going to be a problem. If you go to a reverent novus ordo done in Latin, ad orientum, blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, that doesn't exist in Canada, except I think in Toronto one place. So that's a non-issue for me. Also, though, that's not really true, is it? Because if we go back to the Ottaviani intervention, which was a, a critique of the, the new mass, before it was even promulgated, just based off the text in Latin, the who's who of, of sound conservative theologians in the church, Ottaviani, Lefebvre, etc., they all realized that the Novus Ordo had grave theological deficiencies and presented grave theological dangers as far as what was presented. So every time a priest is celebrating the Novus Ordo, he is at grave risk for spiritual harm. These are just the facts. So if this catechism is telling me there's a risk of spiritual harm to yourself or another, well, yes, I may be able to stomach it. But if I know that this priest, he is, he is, he is saying this liturgy which has been proven to destroy the faith of so many Catholics? How can one say that there's no, that there's no problem with, with participating in that thing? I just, I, I think one has to get to a place of complete reductionism in philosophy to the point where they kind of reduce things down to these little parts and they'll say, well, again, I'm not thinking about the Mass, I'm thinking about the Eucharist, but they're all intrinsically linked. We don't have, you know, it's funny, the liberals, the only place where they're not reductionists is the seamless garment and everything is pro-life. They it's it's not reductionist, the opposite. <laughs> but truly though, we shouldn't be reductionists. So when a priest is saying 
the traditional, well, traditional Novus Ordo, so to speak. Well, what sort of priest is going to say that Mass? A priest who's going to say that Mass is a priest who wants to say the traditional Mass. That's the only priest that say that Mass, okay? Um, so he's in a position where he'd rather be saying the TLM, but he compromises, and he says, I want to say this. He knows that what he's saying is deficient. I know there's a man up there who's having a crisis of conscience while he's saying Mass. And that, to me, is just something that I can't abide, if that makes sense. So, so it's, it's not just about clown Mass. It's not just about James Martin. It's not just about Eucharistic ministresses and things. It's about the paradigm itself, which necessarily leads to a danger of the faith. And I think that raises a great question of, do we want to offer God our very best, the first fruits? And and so that person who says, okay, I go to the Novus Ordo, and I, I love that liturgy. I grant you that the traditional Mass maybe is superior because it's got more prayers, and it's got more beauty, and it predisposes people. I, I grant you all that, but, you know, I like the Novus Ordo, and I think it's good enough. Now the question is, is that the, the greatest good that, that you can offer for the priest and for the people there? And And before you respond to that question by saying, well, what does it matter as long as it's good? Then I would encourage you to think about Cain and Abel. That's right. And 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 so from the very beginning, God has has indicated to us that when it comes to adoration of Him, when it comes to worship, when it comes to sacrifice and offering up, what He requires is the greatest that we do have to offer, the greatest good, not just a good, the greatest good. And, and so that's a question we need to be asking ourselves. And if you are listening to this and you're not familiar with the, what I would call the deficiencies or the defects of the new liturgy compared to the old, there are lots of places online where you can look at line by line the differences. And, and you cannot say that there's no deficiency when entire prayers have been removed, when, when many gestures like signs of the cross were removed, when many words were taken out of context and and left alone so that it's not clear what they mean, whereas in the context it was, where many of the readings from both Old and New Testaments have been excised so that the significance of them is not clear. When you do that, just a, a simple analysis, you don't even have to be a Catholic, when you perform that review, Imagine you were a physician looking at two different medical procedures and you had to compare one against the other and one was much more complete and thorough and, and precise. Or you were a pilot preparing to, to fly your aircraft. Anybody who's ever been in a cockpit knows there's a checklist. You go through it, not just doing it, but doing it precisely, doing it completely and thoroughly. Imagine one pilot says, well, I'm a great pilot because I've only got the two-minute checklist and not the 15-minute one. We could have many analogies, right? right. But, but I, I want to speak to the people who, who, like myself, probably grew up in the Novus Ordo. Maybe you don't have a hatred for it. And, and you hear people say, ah, oh, well, you know, that's the one that's close or convenient or whatever. There is a, a significant difference in the substance. Not I'm not talking about the the... Uh, the res sacramenti, what theologians talk about, the essence of the sacrament, it's still there. The words are still there. But the everything that's built around, there's a significant difference. And that's what we're talking about. And when, when you know that that liturgy you're going to attend is going to involve sacrilege or it's going to involve Eucharistic abuse, and I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but that will be inherent in the manner in which the Novus Ordo is offered in I'm going to say 99% of cases. Here's what the, the new catechism says this. Sacrilege consists in profaning or treating unworthily the sacraments and other liturgical actions, as well as person, things, or places consecrated to God. Sacrilege is a grave sin, especially when committed against the Eucharist. For in this sacrament, the true body of Christ is made substantially present for us. That's the new catechism 2120. I don't think I've ever been to a Nova Sordo, and I grew up in the Nova Sordo. I've been to many weddings, funerals, baptisms, confirmations, and so forth. 
I don't think I've ever been to a Novus Ordo where there was not some form of sacrilege or profanation of the Eucharist. And I'm talking about liturgies, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, clowns and all that sort of stuff. I'm just talking about the normal communion in the hand, a dozen extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion in pantsuits and so forth, but where there's a profanation of the Eucharist, specifically of the kind that the Catechism references. So if you know that that's happening, you are obliged to form your conscience, at least by asking yourself, is this how I bring honor to God to go and actively participate in this ritual in which I know there will be sacrilege? Sacrilege defined by the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, not by Jeff and Kennedy or anybody else. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, Jeff, you can attest to this in your own life and just the traditional circles. I have not met a single person. Uh, I have not met a single person who fully committed to traditionalism who was then okay with going to the Novus Ordo when they had to. And when I say fully committed, I mean like they haven't attended it in like a year. Yeah. You know, like when someone just kind of, they've been, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Like they've been purified or whatever, you know, it's gone from their system. There's just no way that they want to go. And in the rare cases where someone kind of goes on occasion, it's always because of some personal life thing. You know, it's like a woman they're courting and she wants to go or something, or it's like a wife wants to go and meet their friends after for coffee and they go to the Novus Ordo or, or it's like some diocesan function and they work for the diocese or whatever. And the Bishop is going to celebrate this mass for a feast day. And it's the Novus Ordo. Like there's always some sort of exigent circumstance, but it's never because, well, I think this is just as good or it's never because I actually want to do this out of, out of personal devotion, or it's never because I know this will make me holier. It's never that reason. And the only rare cases where I've seen people leave the, the traditional mass and go back to the Novus Ordo is, is if I'm, you know, I wouldn't reveal anyone's details, but it's, it's always for some reason of personality or some reason of sin. It's just like, you know, it's something to do with marriage or whatever it is. Yep. And, and, but that tells you everything you need to know. That's, 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 that's the point is that when their conscience is not clear or their pride is getting in the way or whatever, and everyone calls the trads the prideful ones. Listen, my friends, I know most people watching this are probably traditionally or traditionally minded. <laughs> the trads, I mean, there's obviously pride people everywhere, but you don't make yourself a black sheep I'm blacklisted from speaking in my diocese, for example. I mean, you don't take this path in life. You don't lose your friends that, you know, think you're crazy for going traditional. You don't go through all these things because you're prideful. I mean, goodness, if, if you're prideful, you want to have adulation. You want to have notoriety. You want to have popularity. You want to be the cool guy. You know, you don't want to become the black sheep. I mean, this is, it's a ridiculous accusation. But the opposite is true. You know, when someone chooses the very, and we haven't even really discussed this issue, but when someone chooses the anthropocentric, the man-centered worship of the Novus Ordo, it's because they have this conception. Religion is for man. Religion is for you. Whereas, no, religion is for God. Uh, obviously, we're saved through this religion, but the primary thing that we know from our, our catechesis on the liturgy and the old, you know, uh, missiles and things like that, is that the first point is adoration of God, thanksgiving, and propitiatory sacrifice. So we are adoring God, we are thanking God, so it's, it's, it's God is first, thank you to you God for what you've done out of your generosity, and here is a sacrifice for sin. Lastly, I would like to ask you something if I could. That's the petitionary side of it. And this is, the, the, this is how we're supposed to have in our prayer life too, right? If you read these old prayer manuals and things. This is completely upside down in the Novus Ordo. Um, so, so I guess, you know, that's, I'm kind of rambling here, but the point being is that once someone's conscience is completely recalibrated into tradition, that Catholic sense you have where you just, it's going to be a, a huge heartache to go to the Novus Ordo. You can't believe, I mean, you're not a prideful person. You didn't, you're not doing this because you want to be special. You're doing this because you think God is more special than you are. That's why you're doing it. You, you, it's okay to listen to that Catholic sense that says, I just can't go to this thing because it's like weeping over Jerusalem. And, and there's this notion too, and it's a false piety, 
that permeates conversations like this. I've seen this. You know, these priests, you know, I used to be involved with these, you know, some of these priests, and it doesn't matter who they are, but, you know, I'd bring up these things, and they'd say, well, just offer your sufferings. Offer your sufferings at the Novus Ordo. I'm thinking to myself, what kind of nonsense is that? Like, I mean, you're, you're saying the minister of Christ is doing something that causes the faithful to suffer. That's so weird. That's yeah, that, like, it's the, just the it's source weird. of the source of life and grace and joy and peace is the one inflicting the, the suffering. It, it's, it's certainly problematic. And sometimes you'll also hear a, a priest will say, well, Hey, these are just your feelings. Yeah. And you, you need to subordinate those feelings to your intellect. And I would say, okay, that's good so far, but here's the problem. Canon law itself addresses these kinds of issues, and and you and I are running out of time, so let's wrap it up with some some practical stuff. Oh, you know what now? Okay, Kennedy, listen to you for an hour talk about this. What now? What am I supposed to actually do? And and let's talk about some alternatives and work our way through them with you know using the the church's logic. And uh, Canon twelve forty eight says that a person who, and this is the, the new canon law, okay? We're not going back to 1917 to find some old obscure rule. This is the new canon law. Canon 1248 says, a person who assists at a mass celebrated anywhere in a Catholic rite, either on the day itself or in the evening of the preceding day, satisfies the obligation of participating in the mass. So uh, an example, the, the hot button issue is always the SSPX. Of course. Uh, over and over and over again, the church has said that that's a valid Catholic mass and you may satisfy your obligation. I just shared yesterday widely on social media, Father Murray, who's incarnated in the Diocese yep. of, of New York, famous canonist, canonist, he repeated this saying, you know, clearly you can satisfy your obligation. So that that's a non-issue. Let's take a step further. What about a mass offered by a Catholic priest who is an independent. So he left a diocese or he left a religious order, or he was even ordained by, you know, a retired priest or something like a retired bishop or something like that. And he's one of these independent priests. Can you go to that mass? I mean, by the letter of the law, I mean, I think you can. Um, not and, and, not not desirable, perhaps, but the yeah. the canon law is is pretty clear. What about yeah. what about a set of acontists? This is a, a a priest offering a mass somewhere in a chapel or wherever, and he says the pope is not the pope. He believes that Francis is not the pope for one reason or another. Can you go to that mass? I'll give my personal opinion about what I would do in a scenario like that. Um, I think technically, like if I'm being honest, I don't think set of acontists as a general rule, are schismatics. I don't think someone can be a schismatic if they don't think there is a pope, because to be a schismatic is to not be in communion with the pope. And if they don't think there is one, it's, I mean, I, I think they're wrong, but I, I don't see it as schism per se, although there is schism within state of contism, and that's because that's state of contism inside baseball where they excommunicate each other like the Orthodox. So I, I think there's a big problem with it. But if I'm just being as general, like, like this is the thing too, is we're supposed to be as charitable as possible to anyone who calls himself Catholic and professes the faith and professes to be in communion. I mean, this is, this is true charity. So from like a 30,000 foot view, I don't have a problem if someone comes to the state of conscious conclusion per se, but personally, uh, the only way I would ever approach someone who was a state of a conscious priest would be if I was God, God forbid, in a state of moral sin. And there happened to be a state of a conscious chapel around and I needed confession. That'd be kind of the only time I would do that. I wouldn't go to a state of a contest chapel for my Sunday obligation because again, you're not required to, because if I'm in a situation where I don't think there's a way that I can go to mass, that's not going to cause some sort of spiritual harm to myself or another. I just wouldn't go because that's, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So Kennedy, that's a, that's a very reasonable answer, right? I think any Catholic of goodwill would say, okay, makes sense. But you know, what's interesting is if you look at the new code of Canon law, 844. Yeah. Whenever necessity requires or genuine spiritual advantage suggests and provided that the danger or error of indifferentism is avoided, it is lawful for the Catholic for whom it is physically or morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister, yeah. receive the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick from non-Catholic minister 
ministers in whose churches these sacraments are valid. Yeah. So, so the church herself has has considered some theoretic theoretical possibility in which, for your necessity or genuine spiritual advantages, you could possibly go to an Eastern Orthodox or maybe some rare Anglican or old Catholic or, or something, you would actually be permitted to attend one of those places for your spiritual advantage, so long as those liturgies are valid. So the idea, frankly, if, we, if we're going to apply those rules, then of course you could go to the society, of course you could go to an independent, you could even go to a set of a contest, you could even go to an Eastern Orthodox. Now, following your line, I would probably not go. I would rather err on the side of, hey, I don't want to be in communion with openly schismatic, heretical people. I'd rather be at home. But yeah. but, but the church herself is saying that it would be per permissible. And so, so for those who would attack the society or for those who would attack one of these other practices because, hey, I'm going to be scandalized at the Novus Ordo, the church herself is giving permission yeah, and and inherent to that, and inherent to that canon as well, the obligation doesn't bind. That's the point. So, it's it's assuming there's an impossibility for the normal circumstance. So, it's if there's spiritual advantage. Again, you need sacrament to save your soul. There's some reason. But if you're in a scenario where you're traveling, or they take your mass away, and there's no option that you can be comfortable with, then it's just it's not binding anymore because it, it, you can't fulfill the law based on its own circumstances. Right. We don't want to be like the Pharisees. That's right. right. Which, which we're as as sinners, we're all like the Pharisees. But right. to the extent that we can think about it and understand that the law serves man, and that and that it's designed for our good, and the whole of canon law is designed for our good, physical yeah. good, but mostly for our sp spiritual good. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground, Kennedy. Uh, as we wrap up, where can people find you uh, and your your work and your books and so forth? Sure. Yeah, you can go to kennedyhall.ca. That's sort of where my CV is for all the things that I do. Uh, I have a Substack, mere tradition. Uh, .substack.com. My podcast is called the Kennedy Report. Uh, that's my YouTube show. It's also on Spotify and iTunes. And uh, I have a bunch of books for sale on Amazon. I've written on the SSPX, masculinity. I have a fiction up there as well. Uh, if people are looking for an audiobook narrator, I can do that as well. I'm working on something for Tan right now. All that information is at kennedyhall.ca. And lastly, my last shameless promotion, I promise. Um, I am going to Italy this fall for a pilgrimage with Father Albert Calio, a traditional Dominican. And uh, we're going to be visiting some of the most beautiful shrines of Rome, the Amalfi Coast, Florence, Assisi, and so forth. Kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You know. No trip to Europe is inexpensive, but as far as trips to Europe go, it is a very reasonable price. Uh, and it's daily mass, and I'll be giving some talks. And it's just a wonderful way to go to Europe with like-minded people uh, and get the sort of group rate. And families are welcome. Uh, if you're going to bring little children, you know, they might not be able to keep up if, it's, if they're too little, but families are welcome, of course. Great. Thank you, Kennedy, for being here. Thank you, everyone, for watching. If you enjoy... Or appreciate this content, please please like, subscribe, follow, share it with your friends. If you don't like what we're saying here, you can find <laughs> you you can find uh, Jim De Piante on Facebook. He <laughs> always likes to to hear get that um, that critical feedback. And please remember, this is a a volunteer work. I don't take donations, don't take uh, Patreon or any of those other things. I'm happy to be doing this for you. But we get a lot of flack, a lot of criticism. My family suffered a lot. Even my children have come under attack because, well, of what their dad is, is doing. So I need your prayers. If you would please include me and my family in your prayers, maybe have a mass said for us, I would greatly appreciate that. And remember that I'm praying for you as well. Kennedy, thanks for being with us. Always a pleasure, my friend. And thank you all again. Have a blessed Lent, and we'll see you next time.